Welcome to The Hill's Coronavirus Report. I'm Steve Clemens, editor-at-large of The Hill. Each day we are interviewing consequential leaders and innovators in the battle against the coronavirus. Watching the uptick in COVID-19 cases this week has been startling, but some states have begun to see a downward trend. In Illinois, the peak number of reported cases was about 4,000 a day back in May. Now they're down to just over 800 per day, as that state enters the fourth of five phases to reopen. That certainly helped to those without work in Illinois. But by the end of this month, the $600 of extra unemployment insurance dries up, the result of which may be problematic for millions in, in Illinois and beyond. Congress seems to be at an, at an impasse when it comes to if, when, and how much of the next stimulus package might be. As Democrats pushed for the $3 trillion HEROES Act, many Republicans believe spending that much money that fast is ill-advised. And the ask itself might force an even more partisan dig in leading to stalemates. Joining me now to talk about that and much more is the representative from the great state of Illinois, Congressman Rodney Davis. We've spoken to him before on these issues. But let me just start first with some another initiative right now, which is to look at the question of how voters vote in upcoming elections. And there's been concern because of COVID, because of social distancing, and the risks of some of what we saw uh, in Wisconsin, that, that national mail-in ballots need to be mandated or at least, you know, put put uh, uh, across the nation. I know there's a lot of complexities there. Uh, and Congressman, you have some concerns. So can you walk us through what you've learned in recent hearings about your concerns about a national bail in uh, national uh, mail in ballot initiative? Absolutely, Steve. First off, thanks for having me on again. It's great to see you. Uh, secondly, this is an issue that we've been addressing since I took over on our Republican side to lead the House Administration Committee, which actually has jurisdictions over our nation's election system in the House of Representatives. Uh, we saw with HR1, the, Demo the new Democratic major majority decided they wanted to push election reforms. Mm -hmm. Part of those election reforms were reforms to mail-in balloting, uh, nationalizing ballot harvesting, a process that's already been uh, corrupted and caused us to have to have a special election in North Carolina. These things are not part of COVID-19's pandemic. This has been part of their agenda. And when you look at mail-in balloting, we first have to understand what they mean. Many Democrats mean that they want to mail a live ballot to every single registered voter. And at the same time, as I've been in hearings uh, throughout this country, many of my Democratic colleagues don't want our local election officials to be able to follow the law and remove voters from those voter rolls that aren't registered there or don't live there anymore. That would mean millions more ballots being put out into the street, into mailboxes. That's something that I am against, and most Americans would be against that. It's okay if you wanna request a vote by mail. I encourage that. That happens in my home state of Illinois. But we can't nationalize a process that even Secretary of State Kim Wyman from Washington State, whose state has only vote by mail, she said it would take upwards of 10 years to effectively implement her system again. So things have to take time. We don't want to have to wait for election results. And if Democrats are successful by mailing ballots to every single registered voter, even though they might not be legally registered there at that address anymore, or legal to vote, um, that's a problem. So what I'm hearing from you is interesting, and, and I'm just learning this in real time, is that your position is different than some of what I've heard from the White House objecting this. You actually support uh, mail-in ballots, but folks need to request them. Is that right? Yeah, and, and the White House uh, is, is not against mail-in balloting, what they're against. And it's tough to explain this in, a, in the limited amount of characters that Twitter allows, uh, but we have the ability to come on shows like yours Mail-in ballots are, are something that Republicans and Democrats agree on, but it's how you implement them. We, as Republicans, and I know the White House uh, agrees, we don't want to see live ballots mailed to people who should never be eligible to vote at that address. And Democrats will say, well, that's not a problem. Well, you know what it is? I have another member of my House Admin Committee, Barry Loudermilk, congressman from Georgia. One of his staffers lives in Maryland. He, was, he requested a ballot to vote in Georgia, as he should and can do. He got that one, but then got two ballots mailed to him in the most recent Maryland election, made out to some other names because they're still on the voter rolls at that address that he now lives at. And he did the right thing and destroyed them. But that's a problem. So, Congressman, is there a way that you're thinking of putting together, you know, a proactive 
GOP response on that that makes that clear? Because I have to tell you that I just don't think it's clear that, that, that you know, because I think I'm understanding and understand the sensibility uh, of that, that you would have, you know, ballots floating everywhere. And, I, and, and, and truth in advertising, I, I uh, uh, interviewed Senator Klobuchar about this, and it didn't get, you know, framed the same way. But I think the question is, is there a proactive step that can say, rather than being against mail-in balloting, you're in for the, you're, you're in for that. And then, and then also, I think the other, other part of the initiative that I heard was whether or not the costs of states beginning to look at whatever they need. Because what may, people don't understand, I think, is that, that states define how they're going to run elections and whatnot. So part of it is adjunct onto what states decide. So is there some way that you might be able to craft a bill that gives them the support they need without going you know, to the level of concern that you saw with a kind of a national bail-in uh, mail ballot process? Well, we've crafted numerous pieces of legislation regarding mail-in balloting, outlawing the corrupted process of ballot harvesting that is still ravaging in states like California. Uh, we did a ballot harvesting report where I sent uh, ad observers from the House Administration Committee out to California, and we saw numerous instances of ballots just being thrown outside an outside collection box with no one watching them. Those, they could have been stolen, corrupted, added to, who knows? Mm. Uh, we saw them laying around the elections office to where anybody walking in could grab them. That's not maintaining the chain of custody in a ballot to make sure someone's vote can get counted. Those things we've introduced bills to address, but unfortunately, Steve, not everybody wants to talk about elections. Not everybody wants to talk about mm. the details of election reforms. It's folks like you that allow us to do that. But to answer your original question, We've laid it out on our social media pages, in media uh, in media interviews before, but also uh, we're just trying to build that case that there are a majority of areas that we in, in Washington, Republicans and Democrats, have agreed on immensely. We have provided over a billion dollars to our local election officials to address cybersecurity issues and other election issues. And you know what? None of us talk enough about the success in the cybersecurity side when it comes to elections that 2018 showed us. We didn't have one instance of foreign interference. And that's a good thing. That shows we have been working together, investing billions to help this process. Congressman, uh, as you heard, I was just reporting on Illinois' numbers, and they're coming down dramatically, and they're going in the right direction. A lot of the rest of the country, not the same story. Their numbers are going up and lots of concern, particularly as we go into the July 4th weekend. What are you folks getting right that others are not? Well, uh, Illinois, we have had a stay-at-home order uh, still in place, minimal exceptions. And we've seen many areas, especially the areas that I represent, that have met for months the metrics that our governor laid out to get to phase four, which just started this Friday. So. We're seeing an increase in, in cases nationwide in many areas due to many, a wide variety of reasons. Uh, one, we have more people being tested. We're testing asymptomatic people, which we were not doing during the height of this crisis and the height of this pandemic. But time will tell. After we've seen uh, thousands gather in the street to protest, others gathering for other nefarious reasons, we're gonna see our 4th of July weekend. We still see in, in news reports thousands gathering in places like Los Angeles just yesterday, defying the orders that, that Governor Newsom put forth. Uh, this is an issue we're going to still have to continue to fight. It concerns me, especially with the good economic news that we've seen just recently with millions of jobs, even more so than expected, being added to our economy. What do you think um, can be done on the, on the job front? I mean, right now you see we've got upwards of 4 million new jobs just reported today coming back. You see green sprouts in the economy coming back. A lot of people concerned that the resurgence of the virus could threaten some of that. But I'd be interested just as a legislator that's looking at things like, you know, more stimulus packages. What does that social contract need to look like as we come out of this? Do you need to pump more money into the system or do you need to take some of that pressure off? I think that's going to be determined by the continued increase or the continued decrease or a stabilization in cases. Look, we, we've bent the curve from where we were when this pandemic initially started. But we can't talk about the need for a new stimulus unless we look back, back at the successes we've had. Without the investment in the PPP program to keep our mom and pop shops alive before they could get to a phase four and partially reopen in states like Illinois, where I represent, 
uh, was a program that worked. If it didn't work, we would not have seen the historic job numbers that we just saw over the last few weeks. If we weren't investing in the local tax base, then we wouldn't have the ability to fund our local governments once this pandemic was over. So we did the right thing in a very bipartisan way. We still have hundreds of billions of dollars yet to go out to our hospitals and medical facilities as part of the original CARES Act legislation. So these I, these issues have to be put into the debate and into context in the discussion of any future stimulus. What is the situation now with rural hospitals? I mean, I know that's been a high priority concern for you. I interviewed Senator John Barrasso was talking to me about you know, cases where rural hospitals not able to do elective procedures at, at, at one point uh, were furloughing and laying off uh, uh, staff in Wyoming in that case. Is the situation improving and getting, getting better? Uh, is, the money or the, is the money and resources there for medical support in rural areas? Yes, uh, we've already seen uh, over $75 billion sent out to our, our hospitals, both rural and urban, and our medical facilities. You know, those clinics that are really essential when it comes to getting diagnostic procedures and access to primary care and even elective procedures. Uh, that's getting better, especially in states like Illinois. I, I successfully argued uh, with our administration at the end of April to reopen our clinics, to reopen our hospitals for elective and diagnostic procedures because what one person may determine is elective, another person may need that same procedure to survive. And we don't want to have a higher death rate for diseases we know how to treat once we come out of this pandemic because people were either too scared or they didn't have access to basic medical care that could have easily addressed their problem that killed them or could have killed them. Hmm. So we've seen success, but we've also seen a need to in for that increased testing to be able to be sure that those coming in don't have the virus. And if there are any facilities in this nation, Steve, that ought to be able to mitigate the risk of anyone coming in and getting COVID, it's our hospitals, mm -hmm. it's our mm -hmm. clinics. My wife goes to work at a hospital every day and does everything she can to mitigate the risk of bringing COVID home or coming home to anyone in our community with it. When we last spoke, uh, one of the other shocks that America had, had experienced was its dependence on global supply chains, on active pharmaceutical ingredients uh, largely uh, produced in China, uh, and other dimensions of a global supply chain in national security spaces that people didn't quite realize were as big as they were, as dependent as they were. Um, I talked to former Congressman John Delaney, one of your former colleagues, no longer there in Congress. But he said, hey, we got to take stock. We need to look each year and look at what are our deficits in those national security areas of things that we need to bring back to this country. And I'm interested, it sounded like a lot of my you know, Republican contacts saying that's good. Is that something you, you could support is looking at supply chains in a new way and saying we may need to, to find why stuff has moved abroad uh, that we need and is not being produced and manufactured in this country? Absolutely, I support that, Steve. Uh, my, my former colleague and good friend, John Delaney, is absolutely right. John and I used to work together on infrastructure issues when we served together, uh, actually trying to put together a national infrastructure bank that would have been able to invest hundreds of billions of dollars in rebuilding our crumbling roads and bridges and other infrastructure, mm. even vertical infrastructure. Uh, we have to look at our supply chain. And really, I think as we move ahead, we ought to plan to invest federal dollars to partner with our manufacturers to really incentivize construction of facilities, I believe, in many rural areas, because we have the workforce, we have the, the space, and we ought to be able to incentivize the placement of that supply chain need into our rural communities to make sure we don't rely upon China for PPE when they cornered, when they cornered the market on PPE before the rest of the world knew about the virus. Uh, we have to make sure that our defense uh, industry is able to produce the needed materials here. It's time to bring them back home, bring that supply chain back to North America. And it's especially telling today with the implementation, the full implementation of the USMCA. North America is the place where we should, we should be. And just last question, Congressman. Um, we all have blind spots. We all get things wrong. You got to move different ways. And I know you're out there talking to your constituents. 
If you were to have a talk with the president or vice president or the coronavirus task force in the White House and say, there's one thing you folks have to up your game on, what would that be? Guidance and advice. I know we're learning about a disease that no one on earth knew existed a year ago. I know that advice is going to change. But when the advice continues to change without taking into consideration the advice that's already on the table, what is created is we have a bunch of mask vigilantes that you know, don't follow the guidance or the advice that the CDC has already laid out. Consistency matters. If Dr. Fauci, who I have the utmost respect for, is going to offer continued advice on when and where somebody should wear a mask, then um, he's going to have to follow the same guidelines, but it has to be consistent. Are we able to stand six feet or more away from, away from somebody outside without a mask, as CDC says? Or do we have to wear a mask every time we're in public? That consistency matters because without it, people don't take any guidance seriously. Well, Representative Rodney Davis, thank you so much for your time and insights today. It's great to see you. I look forward to seeing you in person in Washington one of these days. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining me today. Have a great holiday weekend. I'm Steve Clemens. Be well.